turn it over to Commissioner McKiernan. Thank you so much. And as I, I'll keep talking here as I start the process of getting my screen shared out to everybody and hope no matter how many times you do this, you, you come back and go, did I do it right this time? And already I'm lost. Hang on just one second here. There we go. And I should be able to do this and do that. Daniel said, can you share your screen? And I said, of course I can. And then I went, oh, wait, maybe I can't. Uh, I don't have, you still see my, uh, my presenter view, don't you? Um, Commissioner, I see a black slide. Okay, I see you there. I think if you just wanna go ahead and uh, begin slideshow. That's what I thought I had already done. So let me close that. Let me do that. There you go. There we go. All righty. Okay, so um, thanks everybody for having me here today. The, the whole idea behind this, and I'm going to try and jam as usual a lot of information in a short amount of time, so I'll probably end up going pretty fast. But what I want to do is kind of set the stage for where are we, how did we get here, and how do we think we're going to get out of here. And so I have Restart WICO, and I've decided to frame this as a football story. Um, we had the NFL draft last week. We're still on a big high from Super Bowl 54 with the Chiefs. So this is a football story. In any football game, you have the opposing team and the opposing team is COVID-19. Uh, it's novel coronavirus disease 2019. Here's what we know about our opposing team. It has a long incubation period. This virus is deadly sneaky in that it can be inside of you for up to 14 days before you start showing symptoms, before you start sneezing and coughing and oozing and making people go, oh, get away from me. So it can hang around a long time. It spreads very easily from person to person, partly because it hangs around without causing sim symptoms for so long, but partly because now we know that simply the act of breathing can release the virus into the air where it can be potentially transmitted to another person. So there is a high transmission rate and COVID-19 has a much higher transmission rate than for example, our typical seasonal influenza. So it spreads easily from person to person. The symptoms can be severe. Although some people don't have symptoms, many people have symptoms that are so severe they can be life-threatening or fatal. Because this is a respiratory virus, it can interfere with your ability to get oxygen into your lungs and get carbon dioxide out of your body. And that's not good for health. And finally, we know that for all of these reasons, high transmission and severe symptoms, that the mortality rate for COVID-19 is a lot higher than our seasonal influenzas. Whereas about one person out of a thousand would die from our typical seasonal flu, about 30 to 40 people out of every thousand, it looks like, are going to end up dying from COVID-19. And that's even when they get medical care. Our scouting report, so we've seen COVID-19 play its first few games in other countries, and the scouting report is that it can spread so fast and so aggressively that it can overwhelm healthcare resources. There is a fear that so many people can become so in need of care that it outstrips the ability of the local healthcare community to provide intensive care, to provide supportive care, to provide ventilator care. And if COVID-19 achieves its objective of overwhelming local healthcare resources, then the mortality rate is going to go up. One of the things that we know about our team is we have no offense. We cannot attack the novel coronavirus. Novel means that's the first time we've seen it. We can sequence it, we identify it when we see it, but we have no vaccine against it. So we have no offense that forces us to play defense. 
playing defense is very unsatisfying with a virus like COVID-19. So how do we play defense? Well, we do very unsatisfying things like physical distancing. At first we said, mm -hmm. well, stay hey, far lady. away from everybody else. Hello there. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so what we said was uh, we want to stay far away from each other. Back in the old days, a month ago, month and a half ago, we thought that six feet away from each other might be enough. That might not be enough, but that's one of our defensive strategies. One of the things we know is that coronavirus spreads best when there are a lot of people close to each other. So defensive strategy number one, stay far apart. Defensive strategy number two, wear a mask. We know that the virus is probably smaller than the pores in even the best of our masks, but we think that wearing masks can slow down the spread. It can stop some that I breathe out. It can stop some that you might breathe in. And so if we're far apart and we wear a mask, we can slow it down. And then finally, personal hygiene. We know that as deadly as this virus is, good old soap and water uh, does in fact deactivate it and kill it. And so personal hygiene, not only in terms of washing our hands, but in terms of disinfecting surfaces where COVID-19 might live. And especially we've all had to learn, don't touch your eyes, don't touch your nose, and don't touch your mouth after you've touched a surface that might be infected with the virus, because it's that wet contact that allows it to get into your body from your hands. And then finally, the most dissatisfying defensive strategy of all is healthy lifestyle. Unfortunately, one of the things we know about COVID-19 is it is especially deadly for people who have comorbid conditions, that is, who are already not in good health. So as we think about playing defense in the future, being as healthy as we can is going to be our best strategy. Let's meet our coaching staff. Our coaching staff are our public health professionals. They are the people who know health and they know how health is um, taken care of, how health is managed in a public, not just one person, but many people. And of course, you can't have a football game without having Monday morning quarterbacks. Our coaching staff, our public health professionals are in a no-win situation. Their job description, almost always, but especially now, is do stuff, get yelled at. So if our coaching staff does not have a game plan and a disaster happens in terms of COVID-19 knocking us out, they're going to get yelled at. On the other side, if our coaching staff has the most aggressive defensive game plan possible and nothing happens, they're going to get yelled at. Even though we can't draw a line between their very aggressive game plan and nothing happening, we think actually they probably, with their very aggressive game plan, contributed to nothing happening, but they're still going to get yelled at. So here's what happened. Our coaching staff came up with a very aggressive defensive game plan and they said, we're all gonna stay home. Yeah, we're gonna practice personal hygiene. Yeah, um, we're gonna wear our masks when we are out, but for the most part, we are going to stay at home. If the virus spreads best when lots of people are close together, we're not gonna let a lot of people get close together. And I know you probably can't see my, my calendar, but way back on March the 12th, the Big 12 and the NCAA said, okay, lots of people getting close together, not going to happen. And they canceled the league tournaments and they canceled March Madness. And then we, as the counties of Wyandotte and Johnson and Jackson, on March 24th, we all put into place a broad countywide stay at home order to try to prevent large numbers of people from getting close to one another to try to decrease the transmission of the disease with the idea that we won't overwhelm our healthcare system and that everybody who needs care will be able to get it. 
We originally set up about roughly April 24th as the date when we would reconsider our stay at home order. We've extended that a little bit further, but now the question that we are asking is, okay, we need to restart. There are societal costs. There are monetary costs. There are costs associated with staying locked down, with having a stay at home order. And as we have bent the curve, and I have other slides in a different presentation, but I can tell you about how we bent the curve, but it certainly appears that staying home, the defensive game plan is winning. The virus is not spreading as vigorously. The number of deaths is not as high. We are beginning to win the game with the defensive strategy, but we want to see if we can back off the defense. So in terms of when and how, one of the things that influences both the when and the how is our coaches, our public health department looks at previous games that the human race played against viruses like COVID-19. And one of the previous games we played was back in 1918 and 1919 with what has been called the Spanish flu. In 1918, just like in uh, 2020, about March, the flu showed up. Just like in 2020, it was deadly. There were scores of people who were killed by the flu in March, April, and May of 1918. But then the death rate, the infection rate, the number of people who were sick went down, and we thought we were done with the Spanish flu. But in fact, we weren't because it's deadly sneaky. And in about September of 1918, the flu came back. And in its second wave, it killed scores more people than in its first wave. So its second wave was deadlier. This previous game is one of the things that's going to inform our coaches, our health department strategy. And even in 1918, when we thought we'd beaten it a second time, we hadn't, because it came back in January of 1919. And the third wave was still even more deadly than the first wave. So our coaching staff is going to take a very cautious approach, regardless of how we do it. So about a month ago, the mayor decided that we really should begin to get a group together to begin visioning when and how we restart WICO. And there was one day he texted me and said, hey, give me a call. And my spidey sense tingled and I shouldn't have returned the call, but I did. And he said, hey, I'm going to get this group together and I'd like you to facilitate the meeting. And I will say we have had an enormous, a wonderful group. Our two medical officers, uh, Dr. Alan Greiner and Dr. Uh, Aaron Corvo, are phenomenal. And we have gotten a group of business and community leaders together to help us collectively brainstorm how to restart WICO. And here's what we came up with. We came up with as a metaphor, and I love the way our health department did this, they use a stoplight as a metaphor. And right now we are in black, so the lights aren't even on, and that is the stay at home order. But they said, we're gonna phase this. We'll have a red zone, almost full stop, a yellow zone, proceed with caution, a green zone, press the gas pedal, and let's go. And here's kind of how the zones would work with timing. So right now we are in black. We're stay at home. We're under the stay at home order still. And that little green dot over on the right hand side, that's you. You are sheltered at home. And so um, you're not out having fun, but you're safe. And the idea is this, when do we think it's safe to move out of stay at home? So our healthcare professionals are looking at things like the trend in number of new cases, the trend in number of hospitalizations, the trend in number of people who are dying from COVID-19. And when those trends are looking like they're in a downward slope, and when the downward slope is sustained for some period of time, then it seems like it should be safe to get a little bit more aggressive and to move on. 
And so what we've set up is that on, I'll get to the timing in a minute, our first phase will be that we'll go to red zone. And you can see over there on the right hand side, you have some friends. You are no longer as physically distanced from everyone as you used to be. And so the red zone is beginning to reopen. And the question then becomes, well, when can we move again? And our healthcare professionals are saying, let's wait 14 days. Since that's the incubation period of coronavirus, if we wait 14 days and the sky hasn't fallen, then we think it's safe to move on and get a little bit more aggressive. And so yellow zone eases some more restrictions. And over there on the right, you've got some more friends. And if, again, the trends look good, then we move to green zone. And green zone in our red, yellow, green analogy is almost fully open, but still not quite. But we're almost back to normal. So red, yellow, and green. So if you go to our WICOKCK.org website, you'll see the Restart WICO graphic on the home page. If you click on that graphic, you'll go to the Restart WICO page. And if you scroll down, you'll see links to the uh, Restart WICO guidance document. I've pointed to it there in red, if you can read that on your screen. That is what Daniel emailed out to all of you today. It is currently available on the website in English. We have a Spanish version that will be up hopefully by the weekend. And so when we are ready to move to the green zone, the first stage, then we'll have both English and Spanish language versions available. Here's what we did. Our team came up with guidelines in the following categories. Physical distancing, how close or how far apart. Hygiene that is of the person, cleaning, typically of our environment, personal protective equipment recommendations like masks, screening for symptoms, and then how to interact with or report to the health department and how to get clinical guidance. We at first have in this document some recommendations in those areas across both the general population and across vulnerable populations. Populations who are older or who already have some comorbid or pre-existing health conditions. Um, and I will say, I was just chagrined to find out that by virtue of my age, I'm in the vulnerable population here, but that's another gripe for another day. Once we get past the general and the vulnerable populations then, our team looked at applying these guidelines broadly across 15 different, and for lack of a better term, we'll call them sectors. So we've got our essential businesses, which for the most part have continued to operate even during stay at home, to nursing homes, to retail, to office, to restaurants and bars, to childcare and education, through places of worship, mass sporting events, and our parks. And so when you download the document, you will find that it is very long, but it is organized in terms of these sectors. And so you can flip to your particular area or sector of interest, and you can see at a glance the guidelines for your particular sector. And I just happened to pick restaurants, bars, and hospitality, and I know that you can't see that uh, on your screens because it's too small. But for example, this document will give fairly specific guidelines or recommendations for physical distancing during both black and red and yellow and green. And in addition to physical distancing, because it goes to another page, there are also guidelines uh, across all of the zones for hygiene and for cleaning and for personal protective equipment. And so this is what people will find as they begin to uh, look in that document and examine the recommendations for each of their sectors. And right now, what I wanna say is, we recognize this is a very fluid 
document. And I kind of hate when people use the, that term, but it is. It will be changing pretty constantly as we all feel our way out of the current uh, problem that we're in. And so we're always looking for feedback on how this document can be modified to be more beneficial. And the last thing that I will go through is timing. So yesterday I put a red highlight around April 30th. Uh, yesterday we said that we will lift our stay at home order effectively on May 11. Our chief medical officers said that's when we will lift it and we'll go from black stay at home into green first phase of opening back up. We realize that we're not opening back up in isolation. We have the state, two states actually, and a lot of counties around us. And even as we were revealing our Restart WICO guidelines, uh, you can see that I just put a highlight around May 4th. Governor Kelly in Kansas revealed her plan last night. And in her plan, stay at home is lifted on May the 4th. You will find that our plan generally lags the state plan by a week in each of the phases. All of the counties of Kansas can be more restrictive, but we cannot be less restrictive than the state guidelines. We can go later, but not earlier. We can have more restrictions, but not fewer compared to the state guidelines. From May the 4th, Governor Kelly does adopt the 14-day waiting period, and so her equivalent of the yellow zone is on May the 18th. Her equivalent of the green zone is on June 1st, and her equivalent of completely back to normal is June 15th. And so our yellow zone is going to end up being on May 25th. Our green zone will be on June the 8th. And at that point, it'll be fluid. We might go with the states June 15th. We might choose to hold back until June 22nd. But to reiterate, our healthcare professionals, our coaching staff is going to be looking at data like number of cases, number of hospitalizations, and number of people who are dying. And we're going to try to move as aggressively as we can through our phases without having a negative outcome in terms of cases, hospitalizations, and dying. And so to wrap it all up, we, because we don't have any offense right now, will not have anything nearly as satisfying as the wasp from our Super Bowl game. But we do think that by aggressively playing defense and taking our time, we can come to a good outcome, a healthy outcome for everybody. And Daniel, that's all I have. I'm hoping that was something close to what you wanted. And I certainly am able to answer questions. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Joab to introduce RJ. Uh, we will take Q&A after uh, RJ's presentation. Thanks again, Commissioner. This was great. Um, again, I want to um, thank the Commissioner for presenting to us today. And I know we'll, there's going to be a lot of questions that we're all going to have um, following the, the next speaker. Um, Robert Hope, uh, Art goes by RJ. He, he's the um, security expert for Burns and McDonald. And, uh, you know, I've, I've said quite a bit already. I'm just going to go ahead and let him go ahead and get started. So, RJ, why don't you go ahead and take it over and uh, we'll let you present. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I want to confirm you guys are seeing my kind of my opening slide there. Is that correct? That yes, is correct. RJ. All right. Uh, I think, you know, having the, the Commissioner McCarian go first, that was really fantastic, right? That, uh, what was telling with that is, uh, I'll say, helps us re uh, kind of reinvigorate what we're doing and know we're going the right direction, congruent with our, our government leaders and whatnot. That was a really, really good presentation. So when uh, Joab approached me to, to speak on this, we really had two parts that, that we were wanting to cover. Uh, first is kind of what, how did Burns and McDonald respond to COVID as it developed, and then what we're planning on doing now. And 
And one of the things I want to come in, come with out of the, out of the box is it, there's not a right or wrong, right? The commissioner nailed it when he evaluated the, the Spanish flu from 1918. Uh, I have said, and used to in my old days travel a tremendous amount for work and nobody would steal my books. And I say that because I read a book on the Spanish flu three years ago, uh, cause I was interested And one of the things that always struck me with that particular flu strain is typically the flu affects the very old and the very young is the, the ones that have, that have the greatest impact. Well, the Spanish flu is the exact opposite of that. It affected those that were the most healthy, that were the, the most virile of our society. And then you couple that with the mobilization and the movement of that population through, through the country during World War I, it was just a, a perfect disaster, right? So being a book nerd, right, helped us in our role um, at Burns McDonald. Uh, as Joab said, my name is RJ Hope. I am the corporate director of security for Burns and McDonald. And our response to COVID somewhat started January 26th. Uh, we have a team that uh, supports our international travel. And uh, I would love to say we've got that right because we're super smart, but a lot of it was people watching what was going on in China and seeing that it was different. It was different than SARS. It was different than swine flu. It was different than bird flu. And when I say different, it was different by the way their government reacted. Now, we don't have a tremendous amount of, uh, of work activities that take place in China, but when we saw this, we convened members of our board and made the recommendation to suspend business travel to China. And we did that uh, back late January is when we suspended that travel. We also then created a hygiene message. It was very evident that this was gonna kind, could start to present itself outside of, of China so just on our intranet, on our postings that as many of your companies have, we created hygiene messages and we basically centered them on, hey, when you're traveling, it's always good to wash your hands because you don't know what you're who was doing that before you. Just as a reminder, because we figured at that point, if COVID went away, great, no, this is no harm, no foul. It's still good information. Well, it took us only about two weeks later to suspend travel to South Korea, Japan, and Italy because of the way the virus was going into those regions. Now, Japan and South Korea were really interesting because they had learned so much from SARS and bird flu and the other ones that they understood how to very effectively respond to a pandemic or to a virus such as this, and they were able to get rapid control of it where Italy wasn't, right? And of course, it went from Italy to Spain to Germany. But once, uh, so that puts us about mid-February, we then actually convened our COVID response team and actually started evaluating, okay, what does this look like for our overseas operations? What does this look like for our international travelers? Uh, and as we began going through that, it was really only about a week later that we suspended domestic travel, except for critical travel to, for uh, the successful execution of our clients' projects, right? And at that point, a lot of the, our clients were understanding this was the dynamic period of COVID where it was, Every time you turn on the news, it was bad news, right? It was growing in a different area before a lot of these uh, efforts took place. From there, we launched our Burns and McDonald Intel team. And uh, I'll take a moment on this real fast. I, I come out of the Marine Corps, I love Intel, right? It's a thing that helps, helps save lives, but it's also as good as the source. And we don't have a whole bunch of prior Army and Navy and Air Force Marine Intel officers. Uh, we had the folks we could use, right? We had folks from HR, folks from safety, folks from our travel group. We had folks in our security group. And basically we divided up the globe to regions and states that we're operating in. We taught them how to, uh, what regions to look at, what information to try to mine. And then each day we would have a one hour meeting where we convene and share what we found for the day. And what we started to see, which is what our goal was is I'm learning about something happening in California and my state's New York. I wonder if that's going to come to New York and they'd start watching, they'd start to see things and they got really good at forecasting stuff. And I would say our Intel team has successfully uh, forecasted a number of things to include uh, international, such as the increased crackdown that's happening in Hong Kong. Now we had predicated that by three weeks. So we've done a really good job and that really helped Burns and Donald respond. And, and part of that response was really, our um, COVID response team, that at its core 
is a member of our overall executive leadership. It has human resources, our corporate communications, health and safety, corporate security and legal. And, you know, having been and operated in emergencies before, right, it's what happens to the human bodies, you go to what you know best, right? The human resources folks focus on their human resources side because that's what I know and that's what I can control. But I will give our group a ton of credit through our executive leader, Renita Molman. We really rose in this particular environment and worked unbelievably well to the, together. Uh, she had only been in her role two months and then is dealing with a worldwide pandemic. So she was one that was certainly thrown to the fire. Uh, the other thing that we did that really helped is um, it was part of corporate security. We sit with a number of firms locally in Kansas City on counterintelligence calls. And I started with that call and reached out to a lot more folks and we uh, generated, oh, I don't have any of my slides up, guys. I apologize. You're not seeing any of these. Um, okay. Hey, RJ, this is Daniel. We can see your slides, uh, but not they're not in slideshow mode. So if you want to change it to slideshow mode. Okay, so you're seeing this but I've got, that just changed, correct? Yes. Okay, well, it's on the other side. I'm not sure what I did, so we're just gonna, there's only a couple slides here, so we'll muscle through this uh, this way. I apologize. Uh, to my point, what we convened is, is what we called a COVID business call. And as you can see, these are the firms that have uh, been on our COVID call and are active members of it. The purpose of this call was to share ideas. And you'll see on this, Black & Veatch is the first one I list. Black & Veatch and Burns McDonald, we are competitors. There's no doubt about it. But on the corporate security function, the safety function, we share a common goal. And if I can help keep Black & Veatch folks safe, we're gonna do it. And we, we share that resource abroad if we ever have a shelter in place. We thought, what a great opportunity to bring all these bodies together and talk about, especially early on, what are you seeing? How's it affecting your people? How are you reporting a COVID case and internally tracking that? This particular group has been invaluable. Uh, we meet every Monday for an hour. We basically set the rules that it's a no selling zone and it's, a, and it's a private zone so that we can talk and make sure what we're deciding is the betterment of our companies and we're sharing those resources. This has been very, very valuable for us as a company. Then the last slide I have, and then I'll start walking through some of the initiatives that we're doing, is when we got into COVID, right, your first is that response mode. We need to, to stop the bleeding, right? Stop the bleeding, start the heart, treat the wound, treat for shock, right? We're in the stop the bleeding phase. But as we move into that treat the wound phase, that's when we start thinking about the mental health or employee owners, right? Some folks like myself, my kids are here at home, they're 13 and 15 and my wife's here, so I've got some interaction. There are other employee owners that maybe they, they're, they're not wed, they don't live with anybody, their primary point of interaction was church or, or uh, civic activity and work, and now those have all been shut down. How do we reach out and help keep those folks engaged? And as many of you through Zoom, through Teams, we work really hard at creating that, vi that, that environment where we still were in, in contact with each other. Uh, we then had to work through how are we going to get our expats pats back from abroad, right? When all we're having is repatriation flights, working with the State Department, and these flights changing, whether they're coming in or not, and when they're going to be there, and it's basically a touch-and-go type of environment. That COVID group I referenced, we helped each other uh, repatriate people, for regardless of country or company, to get help get them back. We then, of course, had, with like many of you, case tracking, whether it was positive, uh, that was a test confirmed positive, whether it was a suspected positive but not tested because of lack of resources early on and things like that. How do we handle that? How do we track the quarantine? How do we clean our environment so that folks come back? But uh, the big question is, how do we work from home? You know, Burns and Mac, is, part of our culture is we are not a work from home company. We're very proud that we come in the office each day to, to discharge the work of our clients. And we do that here. Now we just launched everybody out, how we handled that. And as a construction firm, as well as an engineering firm, we had critical uh, construction going on for our clients. How do we screen those individuals, maintain their, their privacy, and then also let them travel home? And what we found through this entire process 
and this is kind of my reoccurring theme as we talk about the initiatives we're rolling out, you have to be able to adapt to your environment. And the reason I say that is we all think, and the commissioner put it great, right? We want to win this battle. But like any battle, the bad guy gets to has a say in that, right? When the battle's over, the bad guy gets a say. We can say whatever we want, but the bad guy gets a say also. So when you put a program out there, it's got to be nimble enough to adapt to the environment. And when you come down to that last point there, before I kind of get into the, the initiatives that we're doing, what can we do? How do we bring folks back to work? And we primarily want to bring them back safely. We want to bring them back safely. We want them to come back with confidence, yet we want them to come back with caution. And that's, that's a kind of a complex balancing act, right? Because I'm telling you, hey, we're going to keep you safe, but hey, now you need to wear a mask and don't come within six feet. It's kind of contra to the mindset. So we've worked with a lot of uh, physical measures that the employers can see that you actually see that that improvement's there. We've also worked with a lot of communication using a lot of leveraging from the CDC uh, posters. And of course, we branded those to a Burns and Mac, what we're calling Burns and Mac COVID feel. So that the main goal there is the color scheme and the layout becomes synonymous with COVID. So when those employee owners are moving through the space and they see that, they know that's COVID information. That's something I need to focus on. So we kind of kept that theme, whether it was a wash your hands reminder placard that's going up, whether it was reduced occupancy of our conference rooms, which we split in half right now, I'm basically calling it uh, COVID occupation uh, max. I can't remember the exact term now or limit. Um, we wanted to make sure that those uh, employees owners could start seeing those things. So what we did, very similar to what uh, the county government did, we developed phases and we actually came up with, uh, it, it's technically five phases, but it's kind of a hybrid, right? So our first phase is where we're at now. We're at shelter in place, we're at stay at home orders, only folks in the office are critical. Our first phase, which we're looking to move into in about June, is bringing about 25% of our workforce and we stagger stepped it on 25% occupation. Uh, and the reason we failed to that is we wanted to bring folks back, make a functional team, but have a small enough population in that we could ensure social distancing to a great degree, that we could encourage what makes Burns and Mac Burns and Mac and start bringing those that are comfortable to come back. But we had the ability to rein that back really rapidly. We also elected to wait between our phases for two virus cycles, which is 28 days. So phase one, we're preliminarily planning for June 1st. We'll bring another 25% in June 28th, 29th. And once again, hopefully bring that office up to 50, 60%, right? We're not splitting hairs on that. To phase three, and then we technically end at two areas. We have a Phase four, which is a COVID normal. And what we define that as is an environment where there is not a surge. We are understanding that we have got the environment somewhat under control from our health departments, but COVID is still in our operating environment. It still exists, but we think we've got under control. That's what we're calling COVID normal. And the reason we added that uh, piece is not only are we stag staggering our folks as they come back into percentages, we're also uh, requesting that those that are in a high risk category by the CDC, we're still encouraging them, them to work from home, right? Until we know that either COVID is completely out of our environment, it's mutated to something that's not dangerous, or there's a vaccine, we probably want you to, to, to stay home, right? And that's our preliminary plan right now. We've also worked with screening, right? Screening is one of those things you see a lot of organizations do. Uh, for Burns and McDonald, it was very difficult. We have offices like our world headquarters here in Kansas City, have 3,000 people in it with probably no fewer than 15 or 20 entrances to some offices that might have five folks in it in downtown Austin. And the difficulty we found with taking temperatures and actually documenting a series of questions was, who takes those temperature? How do we train them? It's very easy for a young engineer to say, hey, that's not my job description to take 
hypertension or COVID patient temperatures. And they're, quite frankly, they're right, right? And so what we've been doing is, is working really hard on our education of our employee owners to say, look, these are the questions. We want you to take your own temperature. We don't want you to tell us. It's not our business. We want to know if you've traveled internationally, how you're feeling. Have you been on a cruise ship? Have you came in contact with folks that had COVID-19? And if you answer yes to those, we've got a screening service for you. And you know what? If you're symptomatic, you go home and you can work from home and we'll help you preserve your PTO, work with your managers to find ways. Because that was oftentimes we found that negative motivator to come in when you weren't feeling great. Many of us on this call have done that, came in when we probably shouldn't, is we want to preserve our PTO. Well, let's remove that as an obstacle and encourage folks for the safety of themselves and the safety of the others to not do that. And, and I'm sure many of you are saying, oh, wow, it's a lot easier said than done. And you are absolutely correct. That is a very true statement. But that's to make that work and to, to build off what the commissioner said, the only way this thing works is social distancing. And if you're sick, you're staying home. So we have to work with ways to encourage that. And that, that's our really big initiatives. The other pieces that we've thrown out and that are not thrown out, I'm sorry, that we're utilizing is we are going to wear face coverings in our offices. Uh, and our, our expectation there is if you're at your desk and you're working, you can take that face covering off. But you, if you can't guarantee that six foot social distance, we're wanting you to, to don that, that face covering and not a mask, but a face covering. We are asking them to have a clean desk policy for a while, which is not fun, right? Everybody likes to have their things that make them them on their desk. But in this world of COVID, if I've got to bring in a cleaning crew to clean that, I want all your junk, for lack of a better word, gone so we can clean that office really well. We're going to work really hard to keep it out of there, but we understand it's a possibility. Additionally, we started this term sanitization station. Keep saying that the you know, a good sanitized self and office is the key to this working. And wherever we have conference room centers or there's a congregation point, so to speak, we're putting these little stations that have surface cleaner and that have hand sanitizer. And if you have a conference room and you have hot half the occupancy, you're going to grab that, that surface cleaner. You're going to clean the surfaces. You're going to return it. You're going to have your meeting and you're going to clean it again. And you've got that hand sanitizer to use as well to help reinforce that. Now, ideally, we're still encouraging the use of team meetings, even if you're all in the office. Anything we can do, especially in those early phases, we really need to make sure that COVID does not come into our communities and come into our office. And if it does, we identify it fast and we're nimble enough to mitigate the damage that can do. So that part of that is, especially in those early stages, yes, it'll be odd to have a team's meeting with the guy two cubes over, but a lot of times that's a better way to do that. Uh, the last things that we've really kind of rolled out and done is we've found some providers for antimicrobial wraps to go on our high touch our high uh, contact touch points that uh, you they last 90 days they kill the virus uh, we're shipping those and all the cleaning solvents and all the uh, hand sanitizers to our locations across the nation uh, the one of the unpopular things is we're in the first phase we're going to be closing our break rooms common areas um, and it's not, surprisingly, it's not so much the idea that I don't have a break room to sit in, it's I don't have the ability to get water or a, a refrigerator to store it in, store my lunch in. But once again, high touch point, if you and I are sharing a water dispenser and we're using our own cups, that just there's just such a high risk there. Uh, so we're, we're, we're closing those at least in the phase. And then the last issue that I've got is my water cleaning that we're doing and the frequency in which we're cleaning and, and touching those, those areas that the employee owners also touch. Um, so with that, I know we're kind of to the end and I wanted to make sure that there was uh, a time for everyone to ask questions, but that's the Burns and Mac approach. And, and really it, it wraps around that operational flexibility because we're spraying across the country to help, to help respond and reopen to this. Thank you, RJ and Commissioner. Really appreciated uh, the information. Lots of content. We do have some questions populating in the chat box. Again, if you're on this call and would like a question asked, please uh, drop it into the uh, chat box. 
Uh, if you're on the phone, go ahead and unmute yourself and just kind of grab my attention. Uh, we have a question here from, let me go ahead and find it. Uh, it would be from Donald. Uh, as the reopening phase occurs, how will it actually occur? Will certain businesses in a certain zip code first or types of businesses open first in order to track the resurgence of COVID-19? Commissioner McKinnon, I think this one's for you. Okay, and, and the answer is um, it'll be varied. So the phases are the same timing for everybody. So everybody will start red phase and yellow phase and green phase at the same time. But across some of those, what I called sectors, the rules might be different in the first phase. So for example, in the first phase, in terms of office work, there might be um, that people can come back to the office. But in terms of venues where there's lots of people close together, like sporting events and church services, the, the guidelines might say not allowed at, at this phase. And so what you might find is that there are differential restrictions across the sectors as you go from phase to phase, but the timing is everybody will move to the next phase at the same time. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we do have another question, and this really pertains to small businesses. Um, you know, this goes to Commissioner McKinnon and to RJ. You know, a lot of small businesses may not have the resources to implement a full bio plan um, or the resources to stay in business for another two months. You know, as we look at reopening, you know, what can small businesses do to implement, implement the right protocols and guidelines for their employees with limited resources? Uh, I'm happy to start. I'm, I'm sure the commissioner's got a, a response as well. You nailed that, right? A and opening, whether you're the size of Burns and Mac or you're a small business, it's really difficult from what do we provide? How much of it do we provide? Perfect example, getting hand sanitizer and surface cleaner right now is very, very difficult. It's not only sourced by the U.S., it is sourced globally, right? So it is in high, high demand. The question that you ask, it resonates with me because I, I remember back in the days that you know you go to war with the tools you have, not the tools you want. And in an environment like this, when accessibility, whether it's financial accessibility or you just can't find those tools, doesn't mean you don't get a chance to go to battle, right? I would encourage specifically with those small businesses, the things that you can do is identify from the Surgeon General how to make the mask out of handkerchiefs increase the number of hand washing stations that you have out there for your employees to utilize. We solicit our employees with, a, with an email. What concerns you? What are some of the initiatives that you could put in place that, or we could put in place that would increase that confidence? As a small business, you're more of a family. So leverage that and you might get some great ideas that have limited to no cost that you can implement that would really you know, make them happy and help, help you be safer. Commissioner, and I would see I see that this comes from Mike and Mike. I, this is this is exactly the razor's edge that our healthcare professionals, our coaches, are are on. On the one hand, there are the very real societal and economic costs to maintaining closure or restricted business, but on the other hand, there is and it, and this is where we get into a, a, a tough situation. There's the possibility of increasing infections, increasing hospitalizations, increasing fatalities, and they're trying to take the razor's edge. And so I unfortunately don't have any good answer for you other than we're gonna to try to move this as fast as we possibly can um, while still not causing or contributing to or seeing, however you wanna put it, an increase in cases and hospitalizations and deaths in the community. And certainly as a local government, we don't have many financial resources that are available in terms of aid to small business. We have some, but not as many as the state and federal governments do. But certainly we as a local government feel the effect, not as strongly as you do, but we do feel the effect like you 
because if you're not in business, if you're not collecting sales tax revenue, then we are not getting it and we're not able to turn that back around into the provision of city and county services. And, and I'm, so I'll, I'll end by saying, I don't have a good answer for this one. It is the operative question we have to answer. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we had another question around the collection of data. You know, will this be a requirement or is this being recommended as a best practice? I think there's some angst on, from some folks about collection of data. There's, this is one of the first things that I brought up um, to our health department folks is like, okay, yeah, who's going to do this? So uh, I go to church at Sunday at five o'clock across the street from my house here. And like a good Catholic at 459, 459, I'm running into church and I'm not going to stop and give you my name and my phone number. There's a really valid reason for wanting that. The idea is that if one person in a group ends up with a confirmed case, the faster and more accurately we can find out everybody who's in, been in contact with that person, the faster we can test them to see if they might be already carrying the virus but not showing symptoms, and that means the faster we can initiate treatment. So there's a really valid reason that the health department folks want to do collection of data. There is an equally valid reason for us to not want to share all of our personal data in every uh, business or every office that we go into. If I had to guess, my guess is that those people who want to do it, great. Those people who don't want to do it, okay. Nobody's ever going to come and wag a finger at you because you didn't. Um, but if a case does break out, it does limit our ability to quickly get to all the other points. And RJ, you might have something else on that as well. Yeah, I'll just say from a business perspective, you, you absolutely nailed it, uh, Commissioner, where if we were going to do it and we went through strategies to collect a, a temperature of someone and we thought, well, gosh, now we have HIPAA data. What do we do with it? Where, and, then, and then how long do I take temperatures for? Is it till what phase is that no longer valid or needed? And it, it, when we sat back and looked at it, we looked at it more of a cultural change in trying to change the body to help manage itself. It's a little different if I'm, I'm a, a store, like a, a grocery store or a, a convenience store where people are coming in for services that I might take that temperature. But when we have the, uh, our office, which is all, you know, they're doing engineering work, we can kind of control that environment for a short term. So I, our big concern was the, the protection of that data for the persons of who it might have been. And that's where we kind of lean to pushing that back on them, increase that confidence there. I have a few other questions. Uh, and again, we, we've been, you know, polling our businesses and asking them what their concerns are, you know, yeah. and what that looks like. And so the question keeps coming up and commissioner, maybe you can provide some clarification on this. Um, Cause I, I personally have heard different answers to the question. Does the governor's order supersede the local order or how does that work? And you mentioned it in your presentation, but for clarity's sake, can you kind of elaborate on that? Well, my understanding is that there's a couple of levels on which that operates, that the governor's order has, specifies a timing and it also specifies, for example, number of people uh, in a gathering spot. My understanding is, and, and I need to make sure that I check myself on this, but my understanding is local municipalities, local counties can always be more restrictive than the state, than the governor's timeline and, and plan, but we cannot be less restrictive. So we can't go faster and we can't go uh, easier. Is that right? We can be more restrictive, but not less, yes. So it would appear to me that her timing of the 4th, the 18th, the 25th, and then June the 8th, I think that's gonna be the fastest that we'll go. And again, I am confident that her plan and her public health officials, I'm confident that they're going to evaluate how it's going just as our local people are, and that the timing could be adjusted uh, as we move down the road. But for right now, we can be more aggressive, but not less. 
Thank you, Commissioner. Um, this is a question for both of you gentlemen. Let's talk about liability for the employer. You know, and I know that we've said, we put forth guidelines for employers to follow if they choose, you know, but how can employers best protect, protect themselves, their employees and the public that they interface with when they reopen? I will say from uh, my perspective, and I don't want to say even the Burns and Mack perspective, right? I want to say my perspective as we look to this, there's a lot of liability here. Uh, and one of which is OSHA, I'm sorry, a COVID case is an OSHA recordable. And for companies like Burns and Mack, OSHA recordables uh, hurt us, right? When we have those, it's a safety infraction. It can hurt us, our ability to bid on jobs. Uh, so not only for employee, client, visitor safety, we really look at it from the ability to do business going forward. We really think that the key to limiting that liability, there's really no way to completely eradicate it, but the way to limit that liability is in this phased approach, taking into account government officials, health officials, and what's going on and having it a phase. We're not requiring anyone come to work. Will Burns and McDonald have everybody back to work in the office at some point? Yes, we will. That's, that's, that's what we do. But if you are having childcare issues because of closures, if you are in a high risk environment or you're caring for someone of high risk, we're going to be sensitive to that the best we can. And through putting those measures out there, we're hoping we're putting ourselves in a defensive position that we did our best. We really did the best we could do knowing that we needed to, to, get on with the operation, get on being a business within Kansas City and, and throughout the country. That's that's the kind of my opinion. And, and we're very similar. One of the questions that I asked early and I asked often is, okay, who's going to monitor this and who's going to enforce this in terms of, of restrictions? And the answer is really, nobody will. But if we look at the litigation that is at least threatened, if not started, with the long-term care facility in Midtown uh, Wyandotte County, we certainly see that it would appear to make good sense for employers to be as uh, cautious as possible, because certainly I think there's already been rumors of or, or rumblings of potential litigation uh, for the families who have uh, members of their family who passed away at that long-term care facility. So I don't think there's really going to be a lot of oversight and enforcement activity, but I still think it makes sense for all of us to be cautious as we move forward. Thank you, Commissioner NRJ. I have a question here from Mr. Kent Nolan. Is it possible to get an exemption, exemption or exception to provide what is considered a non-essential service, how would that be done? I think that the best way to do that would be either, either to email it to myself. I guess I could be a conduit here um, because ultimately our medical officers are going to make that uh, decision in collaboration with our public health officials, at least locally here. And even after the first draft of our guidelines went out, we had several people who said, hey, what about me? And they brought up a specific sliver of, uh, of business provision, service provision, and they reminded us about the particulars of that. And we went, okay, or I, not we, our medical officers said, that makes sense to us. You've made a case, it's defensible. Let's go with that. So I am glad to forward on to our medical officers and to our public health department, anyone who has a question about uh, the guidelines or about where they fall in the guidelines. Thank you, Commissioner. And with your permission, we're gonna drop your email in the chat box for folks that don't already have your email. Um, RJ, I think this next question is for you. Uh, this is a question from uh, Dr. Greg Moser, president of KSK Community College. Any recommendations for suppliers of the antimicrobial wraps? Uh, the short answer is yes. The long answer is that I have to get with the, the young lady that had ordered those and, and procured those for us. I'll ask if you could give, provide me that contact information. I'll be happy to share that and uh, who we were able to procure those from. 
Thank you. And, and I think that does bring up a good point regarding, again, our small businesses and their ability to access uh, these supplies, these sanitation uh, supplies that they're needing to open up with minimal risk. You know, now if that becomes an issue, I think, I think, and you all can correct me, then the business or the organization or the nonprofit will have to make that determination as to when it is okay for them to open with minimal risk. I, I will say for my opinion, when it comes to the accessibility of, uh, we'll call it PPE, even though it's not necessarily a personal protective equipment, like a hard hat or steel-toed boots, but the common commodities people are looking for are mask, face coverings, surface sanitizer, hand sanitizer. That's the four most common commodities. Now what's inching up now is the plastic or acrylic partitions like you have at the grocery stores now. Those are getting very, very hard to get. And then the antiseptic wraps that the previous gentleman asked about are, are falling in that category. My opinion from evaluating this and looking at how the world is reacting to it, what we have to remember is Latin America, Chile, Argentina, they're entering their cold and flu season. Their demand is only going to increase. The same thing with Sub-Saharan Africa, Europe, Russia still has not reached its peak. The reason I say this, this will be the first time for a lot of businesses to experience being in a global demand environment where it's not just we're out in Kansas City because the Chiefs won. Everybody went and got the Chiefs Coke can, right? To tie this to the commissioner's presentation. Uh, no, this is different because there is literally no hand sanitizer for sale in the state because of the inability to keep up with supply. So I foresee that getting a little tighter, that supply chain getting tighter uh, globally for the next probably six to eight weeks. We are planning and hoping and have prepared for the end of the third, first of the fourth quarter that supply starts catching up with the, with the demand and you're able to see those commodities more freely. Thank you, RJ. Um, we'll go ahead and open up the floor for questions. If you are not able to drop it in the chat box, I've got a few more questions, but I uh, want to definitely give folks an opportunity to, to ask a question directly to Commissioner McKiernan and to RJ. So feel free to jump in if you're on the phone or on video. Okay, um, I'll proceed with my questions. And again, um, you know, we're getting feedback from our businesses day in and day out, you know, as to how they are, will be able to reopen their businesses. Um, one of the questions that's come up also is, any recommendations for our business owners, our CEOs, our executive directors, as they think about reopening their offices or their places of, of business, any recommendations on workplace layout and what that may look like? And I'm talking about common areas, the bathrooms, uh, entrance, uh, cubicles, if, if you have cubicles, any recommendations on workplace layout and flow of employees and people entering your space? So I will say, uh, once again, from a Burns and Mac perspective, we looked at that. Uh, fortunately, our current office layout, and we, we actually took measurements and put people in our cubes, we're meeting that six foot uh, social distance right now in our offices. So that did not require a, a change for us. Now, there are a lot of organizations that showed you the list that we, we talk to each Monday on our call that are considering that. They're evaluating that because maybe in some of their places they've got a tighter uh, uh, space and they've got folks more packed in there. So that is actively being considered. We looked at a one-way flow through our organizations and what we kind of realized is if we successfully utilize a face covering program, that the risk of folks coming and meeting head to head and passing is actually quite low versus the confusion that that might ensue having a one way traffic flow. So I think you're right. I think there will be a market for relaying out those desks to get that increased social distance. Uh, the days of densification you know, to reduce square footage cost per employee is probably going to, to be set back a number of years as the, the employees don't want to be operating in that environment. That's my opinion, Commissioner. I'd love to hear yours, sir. 
And the guidelines that we have, and this, this was a point that had quite a bit of discussion in it among the group was, uh, originally our health department was saying, let's maintain the six foot spacing. So I'm gonna think uh, on 7th Street, uh, Camino Real, so there's definitely less than six feet in between the tables right. in that restaurant. And one of the conversations we had, and the resolution was unsatisfactory, but what if a restaurant can't make it with um, spacing ta taking tables out, spacing them six feet apart? And the answer is, that's our recommendation. We don't really know. So I'm looking right now, and I'll turn away from my camera and look on my computer over here. For example, in the yellow zone, dine-in and bar service allowed at 25% of customer capacity. That is the current recommendation with green zone at 50% and then beyond green back to full capacity. We're going to have to take input from everybody as we go, even as we get closer to, um, it, ne it necessarily needed to be a large but small group to get these guidelines created. At this point, they are now out in the wild, so to speak, and now we need everybody to give us the feedback that allows us to continue refining them. It's not stuck in stone here. These will change over time. But in general, the guidelines say that at least in the red zone, into the yellow zone, we try to maintain physical distancing. Six feet we're using as a marker. We try to maintain it as much as we can. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, do you, I'm gonna I'm gonna call some folks out here as as we uh, talk through this. I'm very interested in how our social service agencies are handling this because these are the folks that are working on the front lines. And I'm thinking specifically about El Centro. So, Irene, are, are there some things that you're considering with your organization as you interact daily? Your organization does with with vulnerable populations. You know, I think one of the things that um, is on our mind is how we get back to full capacity. So this was great for the fact of staffing. I think the difficult part we have um, is in the lines of we've we, our doors have been closed. Um, so we we generally are not working directly face to face with clients any longer. We do a lot more of it online or on, on the phone, text, online. Now we do still have a few appointments, but we have given our staff the full, um, you know, the equipment needed in order to do the face-to-face. -face. I think the dilemma is when we consider opening our doors with clients, because we too can't have the six feet distance, do we supply them with masks? Um, because it's gonna be hard enough to get masks for our staff, let alone anyone that walks in the door. Um, but we, and we do, we are su supplying them right now with the sanitizer and the, um, the wipes and all of those things, but it's going to even be a lot more when, when that front door opens. So I think we're really trying to figure out how to get the staffing, um, ready, but I don't know what to do about when to open that front door. That's our Thank you, Irene. Thank you, Irene. Uh, I see that we have Margaret Steele with Kansas Gas on the line. Um, anything that you all are doing on your end, Margaret? I think you may be on mute. Okay. Sorry there, I was muted. Um, well, you know, about 40% of our workforce are working remotely right now. And um, I we had a message for, or an email from our CEO Friday, and I think um, it, we're going to if we can continue to work from home, that's what the 40% of us will be doing for, I believe, a really long time, um, perhaps into the fall. I don't, I don't know. They're, they're really concerned about, you know, safety. And if we are able, we never really shut down. So we don't really have a reopening plan. We've been, we are considered an essential service that so we've been, uh, you know, out, our guys are out, you know, responding to, hit lines and things like that. I know that they're <clears throat> using extra uh, PPE, you know, to protect themselves if they do have to go into a home. 
And so, you know, not much has really changed other than us, you know, the, a lot of the employees uh, are w working from home, but it's business has amazingly gone very smoothly. So um, I know that um, we may be, this may be premature, but I think the disconnects may be um, postponed till the 31st of May now. I think they uh, extended it to the 15th and now the, I think it hasn't been officially announced, but I know that um, the governor um, required all, or the utilities that are not governed by the KCC, so the uh, BPU to extend to the 31st. So I imagine all the utilities will probably fall in line and do the same thing. So no disconnects, we're um, not charging any late fees. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how things have been going. I miss all my friends at the chamber, so I miss seeing everybody in person. It's tough working in public relations and having to see, you know, not be out and about, but um, it's the right thing to do, the safe thing to do, so. Thank you, Margaret, appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, I know that we have Dr. Mo Dr. Moser on the call. Yeah, this is Joab. This is Joab. I, I want to, Margaret, I totally agree with you, and I'm struggling with it as well. Um, <laughs> I, I want to go back to what Irene was talking about, which is when she opens her doors, how does she manage when, when the public is coming into her building, but the, thing, the thoughts and ideas that, she, that we can provide, um, I'm going to put RJ on the spot, thinking about what, um, the retail style of business or, or a service industry where you've got folks who come in and register, what are some common recommendations that you've heard that, that she could implement or others could at least be considering as they, as they get prepared to, to start letting consumers into their doors, not just staff? Right. And it's, it's a fair question and I, I'll respond the best I can. And the, the best things are those things that your users of your service as well as your employees are already seeing. And what I mean by that is the plastic screens at the grocery store, right? The acrylic. Those are relatively cheap, right? You, you can go to Home Depot or Lowe's or hardware store and cut the acrylic. People now and in, in what we'll say the post-COVID world know to stand behind that. The other thing is a, a, a security technique, which is called uh, crime prevention through environmental design. And a perfect example of that is when you are inside a, an ER or a hospital, you see red lines on the floor going into that part of the ED where they're actually caring for patients. No one told you not to cross the red line. You just know not to cross the red line. So where I'm going with that is where you're going to have interaction points with your customers, your users, or whatnot, I would recommend putting that red line at six feet because that's education to them that'll get them to pause and look. A lot of the, the places that I've been in and seen where even in our cafeteria inside our, our office, we've got little circles on the floor every six feet that we had printed out and they just stick on there. That's so I know where to stand because most of the time when you see those circles, you're like, wow, that's a lot further than I thought it was. Most people, we'll follow those rules. And in this, what we'll call post COVID or however we want to word it, it's going to be much more um, uh, acceptable to have those type of restrictions. Uh, the, the Home Depot by my house, uh, that only allows 100 people in the store at a time. And no one's out there griping. Everybody's just standing in line and waiting their turn. And, uh, and I think local small businesses would have that same effect, right? I will say, there's been a lot, and we do it as well at our construction sites, of, of uh, voices on taking temperatures prior to people coming in. Me, I am not a fan of temperatures for two reasons. One, it's a lagging indicator that you're sick. And the second is, as the commissioner so well he put, 80% of the folks that get COVID will have very mild symptoms or none at all and still shed the virus. So you're really catching such a small portion of the population and it can be a little bit you know intrusive right uh whether that is the, the, the your clients your customers like that or not right now 
as I said, we do it at our construction sites. We've built protocols in it, but it has been moving heaven and earth to get the, the no-touch thermometers. I can get hundreds of rectal, rectal thermometers, but surprisingly, no one wants to use those on site, right? <laughs> I can get all those you need. Uh, but I, I, for businesses, I really think using the, we'll say the crime prevention through environmental eyes, those physical things we're used to seeing, plexiglass, encouraging those spots on the floor, marking where the stand. I think that's a great low cost way to help that with your companies. And somebody asked about elevators. You want to mention something about an elevator, how you guys would, how you would recommend that? Sure. So uh, in our theme, right, uh, we'll say that the COVID occupancy of this conference room, we're doing the same thing for the elevators and spaces we own, right? We lease a lot of spaces throughout the country and we, we cohabitate. So we don't necessarily own that elevator like we do here in Kansas City. What we've done in Kansas City is put a sticker on the outside that the COVID occupancy is to basically half. We're going right now half off the traditional occupancy with a maximum of 10. So if the conference room is, is 25, well, the COVID occupancy is 10. We're doing the same thing for the elevators. At one point, we were talking about putting little dots on those floors as well. But we thought, yeah, it's such a low number. People are going to pretty much kind of get that anyway. So we just went with the sticker on the elevator door. Strategy that I hate to use is take the stairs. I think the, the one thing that, that I really want to come back to is um, I'll just speak for, for us, uh, not necessarily for, for Burns and Mac, but we don't necessarily have the answers. We have a plan. Our plan is going to be an adaptable plan. It's informed by as much data as it can be. Um, I know that a lot of people say to me, Oh, come on, the high majority of people in any community in this whole country have never gotten it. No symptoms, no problems, no nothing. But the flip side of that is we've pretty much locked this country down since the middle of March, and we've still had, as of yesterday afternoon, 63,000 deaths attributable to, to this virus. And so it's the razor's edge again about, yeah, the high majority of us will not have a problem with this. As I said earlier, the mortality rate may end up only being 30 to 40 out of every 1,000. But the converse is if you're related to one of those 30 or 40 out of 1,000, that is a life-altering experience. And so that's the razor's edge we're on. Thank you, gentlemen, Commissioner McKiernan and RJ. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. We're just at time. Um, really appreciate you all taking the time to join us. Great information, great content. Uh, Commissioner McKiernan, we did share your email in the in the box there. So uh, folks on the line, uh, feel free to email Commissioner McKiernan directly. For those of you that have more questions regarding the Restart WICO plan, we are planning on, on hosting a webinar specifically to walk through the plan, the nuts and bolts of it. And hopefully Dr. Graner can join us for that, uh, Commissioner, because uh, we want to give businesses the opportunity to kind of ask those questions and give you real-time feedback. Joab, do you have any closing comments? No, I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to share our thoughts and ideas. Again, there is no, there is no right answer to what we're doing here. And I appreciate everybody's input and involvement in this. Um, you know, we all have to work together to do our part. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Take care. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you for the opportunity.